All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar on meeting the needs of LGBTQ plus people living with dementia. My name is Katie Powers, and I am the Director of Business Development at Windward Life Care. This event is brought to you as a collaboration among UC San Diego Health's Memory, Aging, and Reliance Clinic, Alzheimer's San Diego, and my organization, Windward Life Care. Why are we here today? We know that LGBTQ plus older adults are an underserved community when it comes to compassionate and culturally sensitive care. We thank you for coming today to learn, to share, and to help make a better world for LGBTQ plus older adults and family caregivers. Today, we will explore the prevalence and impact of Alzheimer's disease and other types of dementia in San Diego County's LGBTQ plus community, the dementia caregiving experience with gender and sexual minorities, providing culturally sensitive care to LGBTQ plus people and their caregivers, local resources for dementia diagnosis, symptom management, and caregiver support. We're interested in what drew you to the webinar today. So we would, we're going to put up a quick poll. Please check any and all boxes that apply to you. And this will help us tailor this event and future webinars to our audience's needs. If you are attending this webinar and need a CMC continuing education certificate, please put your name and email into the chat box or email it to agingwell at windwardlifecare.com so we can send it to you after the event. This will be a 60 minute presentation followed by 30 minutes of Q&A. Please submit your questions into the chat section or the Q&A box uh, throughout the webinar. And we will try to get to as many as possible at the end of the presentation. Without further ado, I would like to introduce our speakers. Dr. Daniel Sewell is a professor of clinical psychiatry and co-director of UCSD Health's Memory, Aging and Reliance Clinic, which offers assessments and consults for people with suspected memory issues or cognitive decline. Dr. Sewell has spent many years assessing and treating seniors with depression, anxiety, and other conditions, including severe behavioral disturbances from dementia. His, re his research has also examined sexual health in older adults, optimal prescribing of medications for people with dementia, and the mental health of older individuals in the LGBTQ community. Our second speaker is Amy Abrams, the Director of Education for Alzheimer's San Diego. She has spent more than 20 years working in the field of long-term care, care management, dementia care, and community health education. She holds a joint Master of Social Work and Master of Public Health from San Diego State University and is a certified positive approach to care dementia trainer. Amy is also a member of the Aging Life Care Association and serves on the board of directors for the National Academy of Certified Care Managers. We are delighted to have Dr. Sewell and Amy, two respected experts in the elder care community in San Diego, presenting on this very important topic today. Dr. Sewell, the floor is all yours. First, I'd like to say, Katie, thank you for that very kind introduction. And I also want to thank both Katie and our colleagues at Windward Life Care, as well as Amy and our colleagues at Alzheimer's San Diego for being a part of this moment and helping us put together a really important uh, presentation in an area that I think we would all agree, unfortunately, up until this point may not have really received the attention it, it requires. So I wanna thank everyone for being here today. It means a lot that there are so many people interested in this topic. I'm gonna to spend about 30 minutes going over these uh, ideas. We're gonna start with some key points and definitions. I wanna make sure everyone gets a sense of what dementia is. We'll talk about some of the common symptoms of dementia. We're gonna spend some time on this concept called health disparities, which is so central to the work that we do with members of the gender and sexual minority community. We'll talk about how these health disparities impact them, uh, and especially those living with dementia or caring for people with dementia. 
We'll talk how, about how we treat dementia illnesses, and we'll talk about how homophobia and health disparities uh, really uh, are impacted uh, in terms of uh, the LGBT plus community uh, when they confront dementia. And then I'll try to sum things up. So I have nine key points. So just stick with me. If, if it's a, a time when you're eating lunch and you're a little distracted, no worries, just stick with me for these nine key points. The number of older adults, inc including the number of LGBTQ plus older adults is increasing. And we know that age is the single greatest risk factor for developing dementia. So as more LGD LGBTQ people age, then there will be more LGBTQ people living with dementia. The definition of dementia is really pretty straightforward. It's the presence of acquired cognitive deficits that are significant enough that they impair day-to-day -day function. So we have that threshold. The deficits have to impair function to cross over the threshold and be considered a part of dementia illness. A health disparity refers to the higher burden of illness, injury, disability, or mortality that certain groups experience compared to other groups. And unfortunately, the LGBTQ plus community is one of those communities that has uh, some of the biggest challenge with health disparities. The, in, in our world of LGBTQ health, the health disparities include things like lesbians being less likely to get preventative services for cancer. Also, we know that lesbians and bisexual females are more likely to have issues with obesity. We also know that uh, other examples of health disparities include the fact that gay men have a higher risk of exposure to HIV and other sexually transmitted diseases. We know that this is especially true in people who have identities that include more than one underrepresented, upper, underrepresented minority like being a person of color and a member of the LGBTQ community. Another example of a health disparity would be that transgender individuals are less likely to have health insurance than their heterosexual or even their LGB counterparts. Health disparities can be reduced through a variety of actions like ensuring equal access to health care by those of us providing health care, being sure to create a welcoming environment so these individuals feel safe and know that they're in a place where they'll be understood. We also need to do what we're doing right now, which is provide education and training to care providers. And in that arena, we really need to work at getting comfortable taking sexual histories. I do see that as one of the barriers that we're facing right now for all sorts of reasons. Many of us just aren't really uh, comfortable when we have to address things that are uh, related to sex and sexual behavior. Well, here's my, uh, one of my cartoons. Uh, you can see here, it's pretty straightforward. Someone's saying, no, a butterfly is not a moth who came out of the closet. And I, I love this cartoon, it makes me smile. I put it here though for a couple of reasons. And one of them is that, you know, cartoons often do spotlight stereotypes and it's the presence of the stereotype that's being spoofed that gives us a chuckle or makes us smile. So. For instance, here you're, you're getting a, a reference to the stereotype that perhaps gay people are more colorful, more flamboyant. And you know, so for some gay people that's true, but not for all gay people. So there's this interesting tension between wanting to celebrate the differences, laugh about the differences, but then also wanting to be careful not to propagate, propagate stereotypes that may not be fully accurate and not reflect the whole spectrum of diversity which exists within diversity in terms of these sexual and gender minorities. Well, um, I don't mean to make light of the topic. I will say that you'll see some other cartoons as we go along. These cartoons are really uh, meant to uh, help us laugh and smile and um, may also give me a little breather here and there. Well, so we're talking now about the aging population, what we used to call the silver tsunami, but now we call it the golden wave. And we've changed the language because we were called out on the silver tsunami being too ominous uh, in terms of the tone of the language. So we're talking about the golden wave as a way of describing the aging of the population. And this slide just graphically depicts this dramatic increase that we're going to see over the next you know, roughly 40 years. Um, and so you're seeing data from 2013 and then projected data about the number of people over 85 
uh, by the year 2050. And, and I think the bar graphs speak for themselves. What we know is that those over 85, the number will triple. And so we expect that that means also the number of older LGBTQ plus adults uh, will triple as will the number of those adults living with dementia. So lots of uh, increasing numbers here. And that's why the, this talk is so timely and important. So dementia is a very expensive illness. According to a RAND study back in 2013, it's the most expensive illness in the United States. And it's more expensive to care for those impacted by dementia than it is to care for those with heart disease or cancer. And the biggest cost associated with dementia is the cost that are associated with getting these people the care that they need and getting them to be able to get through each day as comfortably as possible. So my bias is that the better able we are to treat the behavioral problems associated with dementia, the better it will be for all of us. So um, this slide is just showing that the costs of uh, caring for people impacted by dementia are really a lot about uh, where we put them to receive their care. So keeping people at home is not only the preferred thing and uh, option that may provide more quality of life, uh, but it, and it's also the least expensive, but may not always be realistic based on other circumstances. The most expensive way to care for someone living with dementia would be to place them in residential care and the most expensive form of residential care would be the cost of nursing home placement. Uh, so if we can get better at taking care of people with dementia, get better at treating their behavioral symptoms, we'll be better able to keep them at home, we'll save money, and we'll give them a better quality of life. So that's kind of the direction I'm hoping that we'll see us move as a society. So I mentioned that dementia is defined as acquired cognitive deficits significant enough to impact function. We have a more elaborate definition that's provided by the guidebook that psychiatrists use to diagnose psychiatric conditions. Many of you may recognize this book. It's called the DSM and the latest version is DSM-5, which was published in 2013. And so you're seeing here on this slide, a somewhat more elaborate definition of dementia and the important part here is that it's important that we make sure that what we're seeing in terms of changed behavior isn't due to some other cause. So other things can mimic dementia and we wanna make sure that we know exactly what the problem is that's triggering the changes in behavior that we're seeing. Um, historically, dementia was uh, always considered to be something that progressed. It was a progressive neurodegenerative illness. More recently, that uh, definition has been slightly revised. Uh, we now recognize that people with dementia may have what's called reversible dementia. And uh, an example of that might be changes in cognition related to a condition called normal pressure hydrocephalus. If that condition is treated properly, if a person has a shunt that uh, takes some of that fluid away from the brain and lowers the pressure inside the skull, uh, those deficits often just evaporate and, and resolve. So now we recognize two kinds of subtypes of dementia, dementias that are progressive and those that have the possibility of reversibility if treated properly. By far the most famous and the most common form of illness that causes dementia is Alzheimer's. So you'll hear a lot about Alzheimer's disease or Alzheimer's dementia. These terms are interchangeable in most contexts. Uh, we're talking about the same thing, whether we call it the disease or we call it dementia. Um, we know that it's impacting millions of Americans. And actually, I think it's almost 6 million Amer Americans now are believed to be living with Alzheimer's. It is the most common form. It usually begins after age 60. Uh, we know that if we look at that age bracket of 65 to 74, about 3% of adults in that age bracket will be living with dementia. We know, however, that that percentage increases almost exponentially with each successive older age bracket. Alzheimer's is definitely not a part of normal aging. Now, I, I mentioned Alzheimer's is the most common, accounting for maybe half of all dementias, but there are many other conditions that can lead to the expression of dementia. And this slide summarizes some, but certainly not all of those other illnesses that we know can cause brain injury and subsequently appear clinically as dementia. The good news is in a way uh, that the top five 
uh, account for about 90%. So if you think about Alzheimer's, vascular, Lewy body, frontal temporal, and then this thing called dementia due to multiple etiologies, those five diagnoses do account for about 90%. And that's where most of us in the field begin our process of assessing a patient, trying to look for one of those first, and then only shifting to the more rare forms when we haven't been able to prove through our assessment process that it's one of the more common forms of dementia. Finally, we realized where all that anger was coming from. So uh, this uh, is again, a little bit of a stereotype, but I hope that some of you may be smiling, uh, thinking that Popeye could have been a gay man. Who knows, who knows, times have changed. Um, people living with dementia, the biggest issue, as I've mentioned, is problem behaviors. This slide summarizes the, some of the problem behaviors that we, that we are asked to assess and treat. It's a very wide spectrum. So we see all sorts of behaviors. Any of these uh, can be quite challenging for caregivers to uh, deal with. We know that stage of illness has some impact on what kinds of behaviors that we see. What you're seeing here uh, comes from the Alzheimer's Disease Research Center in St. Louis. At the bottom of the graph, it represents time. Time zero was when an individual first was assessed by the Alzheimer's Disease Research Center in St. Louis. The numbers with uh, negative signs are uh, representations of historical data that was collected at the time of presentation. The numbers on the right without the minus signs, those are uh, uh, observations made proactively, prospectively going forward as these individuals were followed. The key concept here though is early on in dementia illnesses, particularly Alzheimer's, we're gonna see things like social withdrawal, depression, maybe some suicidal ideation, maybe some paranoia. It's later in the illness that we expect things like agitation, wandering, and socially unacceptable behaviors. Interestingly, it's those behaviors that inspire family members to call for help. And what's kind of endearing to me is the fact that it seems as if many families are able to sit with and, and live through the uh, uh, earlier types of behavior change and really don't call for help. But then when things like agitation or disrobing in public or incontinence begin to occur, that's when families kind of reach their breaking point and are coming to get help from professionals. Well, I wanna switch gears and talk a little bit more about health disparities. As you heard in my introduction, uh, this term refers to the higher burden of illness, injury, disability, or even mortality that can be experienced by one group relative to another. Um, a healthcare disparity typically refers to differences between groups in health insurance coverage, access to or use of care or the quality of care that a person is receiving. And so we're looking at how unique demographic characteristics of these individuals impact their ability to obtain insurance, uh, obtain care, and also what is the quality of the care that these individuals are receiving? And does that care really take into account what's unique about that person demographically, including whether they are a member of a gender or sexual minority. So we know that people who are in a gender or sexual minority face all sorts of health disparities due to societal stigma, discrimination, and even at times denial of their civil and human rights. So if we really wanna do right by this group, we begin by really uh, understanding how LGBT health starts with a history of oppression and discrimination that these individuals have likely endured. Now, the good news is it's the oldest of the group that has had the most impact in terms of oppression and discrimination, uh, but we still see it. We still see it now and we still see it impacting even those that are the youngest members of these uh, gender and sexual minority communities. Um, we know that experiences of violence and victimization are frequent among this group. And unfortunately, and, no, and not surprisingly, these experiences of violence and victimization have a very long lasting effect. Many of the members of this community, because of traumas they've experienced due to their status, uh, being a member of the LGBTQ plus community, um, they have PTSD and they live with that and need support with that throughout their life. Another issue uh, that really spotlights health disparities is uh, the way the gay culture evolved. Um, and in part, 
because of stigma and discrimination and homophobia, um, many gay people discovered that really the only safe place they could be would, and, to, and the only safe place they could meet each other were bars and clubs. And so we believe that that is one of the reasons um, that alcohol abuse issues uh, may be higher uh, in the LGBT community than in other groups. And, and we, we talk about the two big risks, the risks of trauma just, and discrimination, and then the uh, role that bars and clubs have played in the life of many uh, gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender people. And so we think that was a pretty uh, toxic combination. And we do know that we see a lot more alcohol abuse uh, or at least more alcohol abuse and substance issues in this community compared to other groups. We know that discrimination against LGBT individuals has been associated with higher rates of psychiatric disorders. I mentioned higher rates of substance abuse issues. And unfortunately, uh, discrimination has also been tied to higher suicide rates in this community. So if these people have a higher burden, uh, then we, we have to be sensitive to that. Here's a cartoon. I went to my HMO doctor today. I think our doctor is an HMO, but Frank thinks he's straight. Now I put that here because it does speak to the idea that we live in a heterosexual world. And it's still the case that many people look at someone and just assume that that person is a heterosexual person. I think in this instance, that was Frank. Frank just didn't even entertain the possibility that the doctor could be anything other than heterosexual. Well, I mentioned uh, in my key points section, some of these health disparities, I just wanna to touch on them again. There, there are many others besides this list. I just kind of pulled out a few that I thought uh, were perhaps most striking. I mentioned that uh, lesbians are less likely to get preventative services for cancer. Uh, we know that lesbians and bisexual females struggle more with over, being overweight and being obese. We know that if you're transgender, you have a higher prevalence of STDs. You also have a higher rate and risk of victimization, mental health issues, and suicide. 82% of LGBTQ individuals when surveyed reported they had experienced at least one episode of victimization in their life to date, to the time of the survey. I was really distressed to see that 64% had experienced at least three episodes of victimization. And, and these victimization episodes were pretty uh, serious. We're, we're talking about you know, being uh, assaulted physically, uh, be, being mistreated by um, law enforcement. It, it's just really distressing to know uh, that so much uh, victimization is occurring to this group and then leaving a legacy of psychological wounds uh, in its wake. We know that anxiety around stigma leads older members of this community to avoid things that would otherwise be good for their health, like routine health care. Um, we know that uh, these individuals often dread entering the healthcare environment because they've had previous experiences that were negative and they're just not sure that the next time they show up, it will be any better than it was before. Um, we, we know that transgender individuals are less likely to have health insurance than their heterosexual or their LGBT uh, counterparts. We have some sense of why that might be. We know that Tobacco uh, issues, alcohol issues, and other drug use issues are higher in the LGBT population. We know that also these individuals face barriers to healthcare uh, and they may be isolated. Uh, they may not have the same access to social services. And even when they do have access to services, there's always that question of whether or not the person that's working with uh, the LGBTQ person is really culturally competent. Now, the cool thing about today is all of you are taking steps towards really improving your cultural competency in this arena. Going forward with other uh, healthcare disparities, we'd have to acknowledge that gay men are at higher risk of H HIV and other STDs. Uh, I've put some statistics here about that. Uh, I'm happy to share these slides with anyone. So uh, those of you who really are interested in studying these numbers, uh, please uh, feel free to get a hold of the slide deck. 
the big issue I have with HIV in the older adult population is that we're not asking older adults about their sex life, whether they're gay or straight. And when we don't ask them about it, then we miss an opportunity to have a huge impact on their life. What you're seeing here is data from the CDC. Uh, it comes from 2017. And what you're uh, being reminded of is that even older people can be exposed to uh, HIV. It's not just a young adult or middle-aged risk. Uh, all those numbers in red, all those bars in red to the right of the graph represent people 50 and older. So it, it would be wrong for us to think that older adults aren't sexually active. And it would be wrong for us to think that they're not at risk for exposure to HIV. And the issue here too, is that older adults often make the mistake of thinking that uh, perhaps because they're postmenopausal or their partner is postmenopausal, uh, that they're not gonna be at risk of HIV and, and that condoms aren't needed. But really uh, condoms should be worn at any adult age when you're with someone that's uh, not your spouse. Uh, and also it's, it's an issue of uh, protecting you and the other person and not being uh, caught in a situation where you are exposed and didn't know that you would be. Um, this slide actually shows some data about um, who is uh, most likely to be exposed. Uh, and uh, again, I'll let you guys study that uh, on your own. I wanna wrap things up here because I don't wanna step on Amy's time too much, but I have put in my presentation this afternoon some guidelines for discussing sexual issues. I wanna pause on this because I just still believe that whatever our discipline may be, we're not necessarily getting the right type of training and practice with taking sexual histories. I think we're embarrassed sometimes, but we feel awkward. We maybe have rationalizations that aren't true, but we use them to step out of that assignment. Like maybe I don't wanna ask someone twice my age about their sex life because I'm afraid I will insult them. Please don't do that. Remember that you are the one with your credentials. You are the professional in the room and you need to be the one to, to be able to speak about this. It's important that we wait for some rapport to be established. So depending on your gut feeling, you may not bring this up at the very first contact, but you, you may find that at the second or third visit, there's enough rapport that it feels like it's safe and there's a context for this conversation to take place. We definitely can put this into a context that makes it easier for both you and the person that you're working with to uh, respond positively to. So you may say that sexual behavior is an indicator of health. It also can contribute to health. And that's why I'm asking you about this right now. Um, you probably will feel uncomfortable the first few times that you challenge yourself to, to move in this direction in your interview. But trust me, I can assure you that over time, that discomfort improves and you are less embarrassed or less awkward and, uh, and it goes more smoothly. You really don't wanna wait for the person in front of you to bring up this issue for all sorts of reasons. They may not do so. They may believe that uh, bringing it up is unimportant or you may see it as trivial or unimportant. This is especially true if you're speaking to a dementia caregiver because they may fear that you're gonna view them negatively because you're the one who's lucky enough not to have the dementia. So why are you complaining? That's really not fair to the dementia caregiver. Just because they're caregiving doesn't mean that they're no longer sexual beings. It doesn't mean that they no longer need our support. You might argue that they need our support even more because of the fact that they are serving in the role of caregiver. So we can begin with neutral unemotional statements like have you experienced any changes in your sexual life? That's a really smart way to phrase the question because it's pretty clean and doesn't have a lot of judgment. We don't wanna say things like, are you still having sex? because that makes a person more likely to feel judged. Like, should I be having sex? Shouldn't I be having sex? So you, you don't wanna use uh, questions that unintentionally may make a person feel judged or critiqued. We use open-ended questions. We wanna make sure we're having this conversation in a private and comfortable environment. And we do need sufficient time. So one of the golden rules I use when taking sexual histories is I make sure I get to that point of the interview before the halfway mark and the time allotted to be with that person. If I haven't been able to do it by then, I don't do it. Because if you do it at the very end, then you risk giving the wrong message that you don't really wanna talk about it. 
uh, and you've put it at the end so that you can just skip over it very quickly. That, that's not the message that we want to give um, when we're bringing up a sexual history. We wanna be careful not to make assumptions. Um, we, we have to remember um, that um, the person may or may not be heterosexual. Uh, we also have to be careful uh, about whether we assume that there could be a sexual problem or not. There may not be. Um, and also it's important to remember that as we age, our preferences of terms of what we do physically uh, in, in the sexual arena evolves. And there's less emphasis on coitus in the older adult population. And older adults are known to attribute as much satisfaction to other types of physical intimacy other than coitus, although coitus is still a part of their routine as well. Um, libido can be impacted. Uh, I think this cartoon kind of speaks for itself. Why Santa only talks to kids. Uh, here he has an adult who's asked for help with libido. Um, so we do need to determine if there's a disconnect between libido and the current level of sexual activity. That's really the focus of the conversation if you want to be helpful to an older adult um, who's a member of a gender or sexual minority. You just need to discern whether there's a mismatch. Uh, and um, you can ask that in a variety of ways, but you can ask if there's a problem. And if that problem is lack of uh, frequency of access to sexual activity, then you have something that you can talk about and problem solve around. You may uh, find it useful to ask about the person's recent sexual experiences, put things in a social, uh, social psychological context, and be really sensitive to the impact that illnesses and medicines have on a person's sex life. When we get to dementia caregiving in this group, uh, we know that um, they are challenged because many LGBTQ plus people for a variety of reasons have smaller social networks. Many of them haven't had children. Uh, and so they may have fewer people to turn to as they try to build out a caregiving network. Uh, we actually know from research that 75% of older lesbian and gay seniors live alone. And so we know that isolation in this community can be a huge problem. We, as I mentioned, they may not have adult children around to take care of them. Um, and even though some of them may be living in residential care homes, they may not be comfortable there and they may have fears or actual experiences of mistreatment or stigmatization uh, because of the lack of training and experience among their caregivers. There's a great documentary that was uh, created called Gen Silent. Uh, it was released in 2010 and it was wonderful because it really enlightened us about uh, the struggles that LGBT, LGBT people have when they're trying to come to terms with dying in, in, in the context of a residential community um, where they may not be allowed to have contact with partners or support from their family. Um, so we can help these folks by making sure that if we're gonna work with them, that we've set up the environment in which we work to clearly communicate to them that they're welcomed. And you can do this in all sorts of ways. There's really a lot of creativity that can be a part of this, but certainly um, having bro brochures geared towards that community, having magazines geared towards that community in the waiting room, um, those things can uh, really make a big difference and make a statement. Speaking of statements, you might even consider posting an actual statement in your waiting room that says something about your commitment to non-discrimination. Um, when you're doing uh, an interview and uh, filling out forms, it's really great if those forms have been cleaned up and really have the right language. That language guides the interviewer and helps you make sure that you're using uh, the right approach, asking the right questions. Um, and uh, so I hope that uh, most practitioners are looking at these forms and making sure that they're up to date. We also need to make sure we've trained our staff and it's even nice to think about gender neutral bathrooms as a way of really carrying forward that these individuals are safe. I'm gonna add also that your business cards can be edited so that you put your pronouns and so on of choice because that also cues people uh, that you are enlightened and you are so to speak woke and that you do have sensitivity to uh, the, the issues unique to members of the gender and sexual minority community. Well. Amy, you've been really patient with me and I'm gonna just skip over my summary. I will show uh, uh, maybe one or two more cartoons. Um, this one also kind of speaks for itself. Um, maybe this is a couple of gay guys at a gay bar, maybe, I don't know. Um, and now I'm gonna turn things over to Amy. 
Thank you so much, Dr. Sewell. That was amazing and so much good information. Thank you. Uh, I'm now going to turn it over to Amy Abrams from Alzheimer's San Diego. Okay. Hopefully we've worked out our technological issues. Am I sharing my screen properly? Can you hear me? Everything's good? Great. Good. Thanks for working all that out for me, Dr. Sewell. Uh, and <laughs> um, my thanks to you. Uh, it's always a pleasure to co-present with uh, Dr. Sewell. And uh, my thanks to Katie and everyone at Linward Life Care for organizing this. Really um, honored and delighted to get to be a part of this program here today. Um, so I, my intention today is to, to dive a little deeper on just a couple of the key concepts that uh, Dr. Sewell was, um, was covering in his presentation there. Uh, what I aim to talk about is how to do this, providing what we call competent care um, to LGBTQ individuals who are living with dementia specifically, and of course, those who are caring for them. I really appreciate your comments, Dr. Sewell, um, on, on that topic specifically. Uh, so we'll go through a couple key considerations, things to be thinking about um, that are different in dementia care planning for this population of uh, sexual and gender minorities um, and their caregivers. And then I will be talking about some, I'll be giving you some uh, specific resources that I hope will be helpful to you in actually implementing all of this. We're giving you some good ideas in terms of ways you can modify your forms and your language and your, your thinking and the way that you interact with clients. Um, and there is good guidance out there for, for doing this. So I um, hang with me, we'll get to that at the end. Uh, and uh, also just to reiterate, which I know um, Chelsea has been mentioning in the chat, but uh, these slides, uh, will be available to all of you as well after the presentation. So there, there is a lot of information and a lot of resources and you don't have to write everything down. So um, on this topic of providing culturally competent dementia care um, to LGBTQ plus um, individuals, um, this is, uh, when I started uh, my career in social work 20 plus years ago, we, I, we were taking trainings on um, becoming culturally competent. Um, and it became very clear to most of us uh, pretty quickly that competence was some, something we were never really going to achieve, right? So the language um, has been evolving in this regard. And language is when it comes to inclusivity, uh, when it comes to life in general, uh, language is really important. So over time, we started thinking less about, you know, it can be hard for a lot of us professionals to let go of the idea of being competent. Um, I'm never going to know everything I need to know to interact um, competently with every one of my clients, um, but I can learn to be more sensitive um, to what their needs are. So beginning to provide culturally sensitive um, services is uh, sort of what, what we've been after. Um, and even more so uh, today, the, the kind of contemporary terminology around this, I absolutely love. What we're really striving for is cultural humility. Um, at Alzheimer's San Diego, we're working very hard um, on this as an organization. I'm working on it uh, very diligently um, as an individual, um, learning just to recognize just how much I don't know. Right? I'm going to do my best. I'm going to learn as much as I can. I'm going to make mistakes. Uh, and then I'm going to learn from those mistakes and I'll make some changes. So I hope that um, uh, the, the rest of my talk here today will help um, kind of cultivate that cultural humility. What's that all about? Right. Um, first, it, of course, involves a, a good dose of self-reflection, really understanding uh, what is my personal lived experience uh, as it relates to this particular issue um, and recognizing that my lived experience, you know, I, I may align in some ways with this population I'm interacting with. I may not. Uh, my lived experience has things to offer me and it also has limitations. So where are my biases? Uh, what exactly are my blind spots? What are the things I don't know um, that I need to know? 
Um, this concept of focusing on outcomes and not intentions is uh, comes to us from the, um, the, the recent literature on white supremacy and anti-racism, um, which I think is a really important concept, right? We, we do our best and um, we try not to do things that are harmful to our LGBTQ clients, um, for example, um, but just doing our best, um, having good intentions ultimately isn't what matters, right? It, what matters is how inclusive our environment really is, how non-discriminatory our practices really are. So focus ultimately on um, the outcomes that your clients uh, are experiencing. Uh, this requires, of course, that we keep learning lifelong curiosity about other people um, is critically important to being a, a culturally humble person um, and uh, seeking out always new resources for continued learning. Uh, so Dr. Sewell gave some uh, terrific insight into what we can do as professionals, as practitioners in a variety of healthcare um, and long-term care settings to make our environments more welcoming to our LGBTQ uh, clients. Um, first, I'd say, you know, have a look at your organization itself, right? How diverse is your staff? What are those uh, lived experiences? The staff that are doing the direct in the trenches work with clients, um, as well as the organization, the organization's leadership, its, uh, its governance, if there's a board of directors or outside advisors and other key stakeholders. Um, think hard, look hard at uh, the language that you're using and, and the inclusivity of it. Um, it's always evolving. Um, there are lots of great resources out there for um, kind of checking yourself. And I think that's really important, right? We can update our forms uh, to include uh, a range of gender identities, right? And also oops, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of whenever possible um, in your forms, in your questionnaires, or just in your sort of assessment templates that you're using Using to interact with clients, that you're giving people lots of opportunity to self-describe um, not only gender identity, but you know, sexual orientations and relationships to other people, which of course are very important when we're talking about um, dementia care in particular. Um, keep revisiting this, right? Um, engage in that lifelong learning. The, the, the language, the discourse around these issues is always evolving, and that's a really good thing. I think there's there's times we can feel frustrated and like gosh I'm never I'm never going to get this right I'm never going to catch up with the world um, and actually I'd encourage you to see that as a really good thing right um, we're 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 evolving and we're becoming more inclusive over time so really encourage you to engage in a, a comprehensive materials audit right really look at your website your brochures your materials look at that language here's where your diverse um, staff leadership governance advisors stay stakeholders can really uh, come in handy, right? Have a look at the messaging, um, both the uh, explicit language that you use and also the, the, um, the more subtle things like images, right? Um, the, the images of people and families and caregiving relationships that you're using. Um, and of course, inclusivity has to kind of come from within. So um, working on your own behavior, um, being you know, as empathetic, as non-judgmental, keeping your, your mind as open to the possibilities um, uh, as possible. Um, Dr. Sewell's uh, cartoons are such, uh, such a great example of this and always such a good um, kind of cognitive check for me on the, um, my bias and the way, the, the, the assumptions that I make about people. I, I just love them. So um, just keep moving, right? Always continuously re reassessing where we're at. Um, so in identifying the needs of our clients who are living with dementia and their family caregivers, um, again, it, this is just so important. We're gonna underscore this repeatedly, I'm sure here today, check your assumptions about who this person is, what they need, what their relationships are. Right? Give those, those um, ample opportunities for self-identification. And as Dr. Sewell indicated, the use of open-ended questions is critically important um, in, in all caregiving relationships, but I think in, in particular with, with this population, right? Asking when it comes to identifying the needs of the person living with dementia and their care partner, asking things like, um, who are you relying on uh, for help? Who helps you? Who are you relying on for care? Um, and just let it, you know, letting that conversation flow. 
um, the language itself can, can be problematic. And so having a, a recognition that different cultural groups uh, use these words that you see on the screen here differently. We've all got different definitions of who our family is, um, who, who exactly is kin. Uh, the word caregiver does not mean the same thing, right? Cross-culturally um, and even within um, cultural groups. I want to um, just sort of step back here for a second and acknowledge um, while in, in the name of efficiency, we're using the term LGBTQ um, or LGBTQ+, um, we in no way are thinking about these groups as um, a monolith, right? There's lots of diversity within that community too. Um, so all of these words mean something different to every individual person and we really need um, to, to be providing good client-centered and family-centered care, we have to be asking what these definitions are to them. So open-ended questions about um, what it means to be a caregiver, a care partner, um, a spouse, right? The word spouse doesn't mean the same thing um, to, to every individual person. So um, I'll talk now a little bit about some of the, the special considerations when it comes to dementia care planning. Um, we generally talk about doing care planning for people. I want to encourage us to think about doing care planning with people, right? Really um, being empathetic, uh, bringing them into the care planning process. Um, one of the things that is so critically different about dementia care planning from other types of client work that we may be doing um, with older adults or people with other types of physical or cognitive disabilities is that dementia care planning really has to involve care partners, right? It is the unavoidable consequence of these diseases that um, individuals with a progressive neurodegenerative condition like Alzheimer's or these other forms of dementia um, are going to lose decision-making capacity over time, right? Yes, it's, it's possible that may not happen. They may have to die of something else but before the disease progresses to that point. But in terms of um, ethical and uh, thorough and complete care planning for people with dementia, we absolutely have to be thinking about, talking about, planning for, and documenting for a time that this person is not going to be able to uh, represent their own their own wishes and their own decisions. So for a lot of us, I think especially social workers, um, we've been trained in, in what's called client-centered care. And in the medical community, it's patient-centered care. Um, and of course, this is a, a worthy endeavor. This is a good practice, putting your client's needs above all else. Um, dementia care planning is a bit different because we really do have to engage in what we call, for lack of a better word, we call it family-centered care planning. We have to be thinking about um, the needs of the person who's providing the care to the person who is losing decision-making capacity, especially when that person is the decision-maker. This is really tricky terrain right, um, for, for us to navigate. Uh, Dr. Sewell did a really good job of covering most of this, so he uh, kind of let me off the hook having to go through this in too much detail, which I'm, I'm glad about, but I want to reinforce a couple of key points, right? Um, LGBTQ older adults are less likely to, ha to have relationships with healthcare providers, less likely to reach out to us as, as social service providers um, for fear of discrimination and harassment for all of the reasons that were described earlier. Um, the statistics tell us that nearly a third of transgender people don't have a primary care, a regular, a relationship with a regular doctor. They report poor overall health. So when we think about um, dementia care planning, right, many of these clients are not going to have a diagnosis, so they're not going to have an accurate diagnosis, right, they may not be connected to appropriate treatment um, planning. We talked about the higher rates of smoking, alcohol consumption, obesity um, uh, that increase, uh, that are higher levels in, in the LGBTQ community. All of these lifestyle factors, I want to note, um, increase a person's risk of developing dementia. Um, so while I, I don't know uh, off the top of my head statistics on dementia rates in this population, right, we can certainly draw some, some assumptions. We need to be attuned um, to the possibility of undiagnosed dementia um, in these clients when we're assessing them. 
Also, um, there, there was information in the last presentation about um, HIV related cognitive disorder. Um, and so, you know, now that individuals with HIV is able to be successfully managed now, um, they live into old age um, terrifically, right? More than half of patients with an HIV, uh, with HIV have an associated neurocognitive disorder. So these are things to be aware of um, in our clients as we're engaging in care planning. Additionally, um, I talked about the word family meaning different things to different groups. So we have to um, sort of dig in and, and know what that means. If we're gonna do accurate family-centered um, care planning, what exactly does family mean? Right? As you heard before, um, less LGBT older adults are four times less likely to have children um, than their uh, heterosexual peers, twice as likely to be single uh, and, uh, and or live alone. Um, there are often old, significant challenges, uh, uh, relationship issues, uh, estrangement from families of origin um, within this population. So we have to recognize they have a, a different type of support system um, than what we might just sort of be assuming is the norm right, for, for our clients. Um, families of choice is a really important concept um, in this community, right, recognizing that family may mean um, partners, ex-partners, friends, right, members, members of the community, other sort of affiliated, uh, affinity-based um, groups rather than actual biological family, um, much more so um, than in the non-minority uh, community. So again, we have to engage in family-centered care planning rather than focusing just on the person who's living with dementia, um, if, if there is in fact family and a support system around them. And if there's not a family, if there's not a support system around the person who's living with dementia, um, this really is sort of duty and, and job number one um, for us as the professionals that are serving them. We really have to um, early on connect them to agents, advocates, responsible parties, people that can be um, down the road, not necessarily in the, the beginning of the journey, but um, we have to be connecting LGBTQ clients who are living with memory loss, um, cognitive changes related to dementia, we need to be connecting them to uh, resources for that kind of support. I'll talk a little bit more about that here in a moment. So uh, a couple quick notes on the needs of our, caregiver, our caregiving community uh, within these populations. Right? Some interesting information out there. Um, LGBTQ siblings are more likely to be um, burdened, saddled, to take on the responsibility of caring for aging parents um, than non-LGBTQ siblings. There are assumptions within families often that, you know, well, that person is single because they're not a heterosexual married person, um, that they don't have family, right? They may very well have family. They have family of choice, um, but they are sort of seen as the, the single non-encumbered uh, member of the family, so this is your job. Um, conversely, we also see that a lot of um, uh, partners are caring for each other. So dementia caregiving in this community tends to be more um, a person caring for someone within their own age cohort, which is really challenging. Dementia caregiving um, is physically and emotionally exhausting work, um, as I probably don't need to tell you. Um, and so having an older person caring for another older person um, with dementia, that happens more often in this population. Uh, they're more likely to be caring for their loved one, the person who's living with dementia within a, a state of social isolation of their own um, or in circumstances of financial distress for all of the health disparity reasons that Dr. Sewell covered, right? Those health disparities themselves increase the likelihood that the caregiver has chronic underlying physical and mental health needs um, that interfere with their ability to carry out the tasks of dementia caregiving. Um, and of course, um, ca caregivers, care partners, care providers in this population, um, because they are so often marginalized, they may never have been asked um, by that. We're getting better, I think, as healthcare providers and social service providers at learning to think about the needs of caregivers as well as the needs of uh, the people who are living with dementia. But if our cognitive bias is not allowing us to think that that other person in the room here is the caregiver, right? Um, we may not be asking them about their needs. 
So a couple quick notes on advanced care planning. The needs here are no different in this population um, than any other uh, group of individuals, right? We all, anybody who's living with early dementia needs to be engaging in what we call capacity planning, right? Planning ahead for that time that uh, they won't be able to make decisions um, on their own. So it is important that we talk with them about what their care goals are, talk, talk with them about their personal definitions of quality of life and get that stuff um, down on paper. Right? So the key documents, again, no different for LGBTQ individuals um, than uh, uh, then the, the general population, right? Getting those powers of attorney in place, um, getting HIPAA waivers signed, um, getting post forms, the physician's orders for life-sustaining treatment, um, talking with financial and medical institutions about other documents that they uh, require or that are gonna make life a little easier for that care partner down the road. Um, while legally speaking, the needs are the same, we have to, I think, sort of give this a little extra emphasis, right? When we are assessing um, a person with dementia, when we're engaging in that care planning process, um, because they're probably less likely to have these documents in place and or the care partner, depending upon bias within the institution that they're dealing with, right? It may not just be sort of accepted that somebody of the same sex, um, for example, is in fact the next of kin. This is in fact the spouse. I have the freedom to talk with this person. Um, there's just so much more sort of um, assumption that works against the person living with dementia um, and the care partner that makes this type of advanced care planning um, even more important, talking about it, I should say. So certainly disparities, discrimination abounds within the long-term care system um, for this population. And we, we talked a little bit about um, a residential care, right? What, what can happen in assisted living, skilled nursing facilities, memory care communities. Um, but keep in mind, right, these are, these are issues for people who are receiving in-home care services, people participating in adult day programs, right, subject to the same the same bias, the same stigma. Um, so challenges come up when it, you know we're assuming something about someone's gender identity, for example, um, and making a, a match for a caregiver um, for in-home care services that would be a good fit for this person. Uh, assigning roommates within assisted living or memory care or skilled nursing um, facilities, right? So again, it's very important that staff um, of uh, in-home care providers, adult day programs, pace centers, um, and of course, residential care communities are asking these questions and, and not making assumptions, allowing people um, to self-identify. So stigma, discrimination, and of course, um, aggression, actual you know, uh, bullying um, and, and the, the withholding of care, um, unfortunately, is, is, is possible um, and in fact, um, uh, common in these, in these environments. Um, one very important thing to be aware of um, with our older adult LGBTQ um, uh, clients is the issue of veterans benefits, right? There are a lot of people, um, as Dr. Sewell was, was talking about, you know, discrimination and, you know, our laws, our advocacy is, is changing, um, society is changing. Uh, we're going to see less and less of this over time, right, as the, the generation um, sort of shifts. Um, but there are still a lot of uh, clients out there that we're all actively serving right now, um, veterans who were dishonorably discharged for um, the, their gender identity, sexual orientation, or, you know, frankly, it really wasn't about their identity or their orientation. It was about their behavior, right? So uh, back in 2011, uh, President Obama adopted a policy that granted honorable discharges to people who were discharged um, inappropriately uh, by, by the military um, for their sexual orientation, but it's a process, right? This is, this is something we have to often shepherd um, people through. I'm just sharing this because I, I found it very touching um, and very moving. This is the headstone of a veteran um, named Leonard Matlovich. Um, he died in the 80s, uh, 1988, it looks like. Um, his headstone doesn't have his name on it, but we know who he was, um, that when I was in the military, they gave me a medal for killing two men and a discharge for loving one. I kind of choke up when I just uh, read that. It's um, very powerful. Uh, Ooh, okay, let's get to let's get to laws, and I'll I'll stop I'll stop stop tearing up here. Um, this I'm not going to go through this in great detail. This is here for your reference. If you're reviewing the slides later, you can look back um, and, and look some of this stuff. If you look 
some of this stuff up if you're interested. Um, Canner, the California uh, Advocates for Nursing Home Reform has a, a wonderful page um, with a lot of uh, great information about um, legal and advocacy needs of, of, uh, for people with uh, LGBT people. Um, so of course, just a couple highlights here. Um, all states now, uh, as of 2015, must recognize um, same-sex marriage and, and other unions. Um, we do have pretty good federal law when it comes to um, protecting nursing home residents from uh, discrimination based on sexual orientation or gender identity, but not um, residential care uh, facilities. We haven't gotten there yet. There's legislation in the works that has not been passed. It's been sitting there sort of paused um, for years. Um, that's federal, of course, in California. We have a lot more legislation around these issues. There is an LGBT uh, senior bill of rights in place that prohibits discriminatory actions um, by uh, staff uh, within uh, long-term care facilities of all kinds. And we've got um, a lot of additional protections in place that ensure that um, insurance companies can't discriminate um, based on gender uh, or uh, sexual orientation, Medi-Cal eligibility rules, right, that partners um, can, can apply, same-sex partners, for example, um, and of course, new um, LGBT training requirements for um, staff within long-term care facilities. So we're getting there, um, but we're kind of pushing, pushing that road pretty slowly. Just a couple um, notes on death care um, individuals, you know, LGBTQ individuals um, living with dementia. We want them to be engaging in conversations about end of life care um, and the death care that they want. So what's important is that we're we're having these uh, conversations uh, to to ensure that um, their individual wishes are going to be honored regardless um, of their uh, particular identity. Um, not not always assumed. We we see this happen often that a person obituary is written in a way that completely erases so much of their key identity and it's um it's a huge loss um, to the people that were important in their life. So we encourage people to, in addition to um, arranging for powers of attorney, designate a funeral um, agent, right? That you know will uh, write the obituary the right way, um, who will take care of things like getting the, the proper grave markers um, with a, you know, maybe the person doesn't um, use the name they were assigned at birth because it didn't fit with their uh, gender identity, right? So people can be buried with different names and they should be. Right, if, if that was their wish. Um, and just a quick note to, to say military burials for LGBTQ veterans are absolutely possible. Um, uh, they are available. And um, if a person was dishonorably discharged because of their LGBTQ status, um, that can, again, uh, that policy, that can, that can be changed and they can get an appropriate military uh, burial. So now, uh, before I wrap up, I'm just going to share some of the resources for doing some of this stuff that we've been talking about. Um, if I may, Dr. Sewell, can I have you actually describe um, UC San Diego's um, programs here instead of me not doing it justice? Oh, sure. I'd be happy to. And let me just say, Amy, your tears are really just a sign of how sincere you care <laughs> and how deeply you care. And, and so, you know, uh, I, I thought that was very poignant. Um, so thankfully, uh, we have a, a spectrum of services here at UC San Diego, and most of our services center around three departments, psychiatry, internal medicine, and neurology or neurosciences. So each of those three departments has a spectrum of, of uh, clinicians and services that they can provide. Psychiatrically, we have a senior behavioral health program that provides um, inpatient care, outpatient care, and an intensive outpatient program. Uh, we have, as you heard in my introduction, a memory aging and resilience clinic uh, where we do comprehensive assessments of older adults who may have some concern about a change in memory or other cognitive problem. Uh, we also have, and we're very proud of our Shiley Marcus Alzheimer's Disease Research Center, uh, which um, offers a whole spectrum of opportunities for older adults uh, with and without cognitive illness to engage in research that advances our field. Um, and we have also within that a comprehensive Alzheimer's uh, program uh, that we can uh, use to help and support uh, individuals and families. Thank you. Thanks. So there's such an incredible array there. Appreciate being able to hear from you directly on that. 
um, Alzheimer's San Diego, for those of you that aren't familiar with us, we're a local nonprofit organization. Um, we're independent. We just serve San Diego County. Um, and we do provide an array of education and social work support services. Um, we can connect people to information and referral to diagnostic clinics, um, providers such as UCSD, um, and of course, information about um, opportunities to engage in research and clinical research here in San Diego. Um, so just a, a few notes, and most of you are probably well familiar with these resources, but just want to make sure these are all kind of in your, in your toolkit, right, um, resources for um, Dr. Sewell was talking about um, the behavioral symptoms of dementia. People need support around these things, right? Individuals living with dementia need um, stimulating activity. They need exercise and they need engagement. Um, care partners, caregivers need a break, right? They need to learn new skills. Um, yes, uh, they need to go to support groups and they need to go to classes, but they also just need um, time away every now and then. So the resources that we have here in San Diego County, um, for those of you who are local, um, are rich uh, and extensive. We have a, a, a host of adult day programs that specialize um, in caring for people and providing support to people who are living with dementia. Um, we have an amazing array of, uh, PACE has a, an extensive network here in San Diego County. Now the program of all inclusive care for the elderly. Um, we have a, a wonderful community of aging life care managers, and I'm sure that um, Katie will take a moment and tell you about one of them in particular, um, uh, Windward Life Care, but we have a lot of great aging life care professionals here in San Diego County, um, respite providers, both in-home as well as uh, residential care options. Um, and then of course, we have an award-winning uh, 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 registry program called Take Me Home, a wandering response program operated by the San Diego Sheriff's Department for people who are um, living with dementia or any type of uh, memory impairment or other type of cognitive or intellectual impairment um, that may put them at risk for wandering, for getting lost. Um, so uh, locally at Alzheimer's San Diego, that's a, that's a little picture of our office where none of us are working at the moment, but we're headquartered in Kearney Mesa. We all miss it so much. I put that picture up every time, every chance I get. Um, uh, the array of services that we provide, education, social work, um, social activities to keep people um, active and moving and engaged, uh, connection to respite resources. We've got a telephone check-in program for people with dementia who are living alone. As we were talking about in this population, people are much more likely to, uh, while maybe not socially isolated, just to live alone and, and need that support. And of course, those safety services. Um, a lot of great resources here in San Diego County um, related to um, supporting these uh, dementia caregivers in particular, the Glenner Alzheimer's Family Centers, Jewish Family Service of San Diego, um, the Southern Caregiver Resource Center, um, the VA's Caregiver Support Program is robust um, and, and terrific. And of course, um, I'll have to throw us in there too. Um, this is just a quick visual of all the things we do um, at Alzheimer's San Diego. Visit our website if you'd like to know more about any of those. Um, so here are um, several of the sources that I used um, in, in putting together uh, my presentation here today. I didn't cite every statistic um, just in the name of visual simplicity, but I got the information from these sources. Um, uh, the L San Diego LGBTQ Community Center, also just referred to as the center, um, is an amazing resource um, for uh, this community here in San Diego County. Um, if you're interested in uh, locating LGBTQ um, friendly housing options, Elder Help of San Diego and the center both um, can connect you to that information information. Um, there's an uh, SAGE uh, offers the LGBTQ elder hotline. Um, this is a really cool service, a 24-7 um, telephone support for um, older LGBTQ, not just dementia specific, but older adults who are in need of connection to resources. They also, SAGE also operates the National Resource Center on LGBT Aging. Um, and I mentioned Canner already, who has this terrific um, uh, list of advocacy and, and resources or uh, 
advocacy and legal resources. Um, and so finally, if you're interested in resources for um, kind of doing some of these materials audits, looking at your language, looking at your forms, um, there's a lot of good resources out there for you as a professional or as an organization as well. Um, Sage Care offers training and credentialing. Um, both Alzheimer's San Diego and Windward are Sage um, credentialed organizations. Um, the Human Rights Campaign has a wonderful um, uh, sort of toolbox of resources for kind of looking at your forms and your language. Um, and it's very current um, and, and very has been very helpful to me. Um, the San Diego Equality Business Association is our local LGBTQ and ally um, chamber of commerce. Um, and then there are uh, an array of uh, really qualified uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion strategists out there um, who can sort of consult with companies uh, or individuals one-on-one -on -one, um, who want to learn more about how to how to sort of better reach and serve these communities. So that's it for me. Well, thank you so much, Amy and Dr. Sewell for all of this amazing, helpful information that you've shared with us today. Uh, before we get into the Q&A portion, I just wanna take a moment to share a little bit about Windward Life Care and how we support older and disabled adults throughout San Diego County. Uh, Windward Life Care provides in-home caregiving aging life care management, and home health nursing services. Um, like Amy mentioned, Windward has earned a silver level certification from Sage Care and training our staff on how to work supportively with LGBTQ older adults and family caregivers. Uh, like Amy mentioned, Sage is the country's largest nonprofit dedicated to improving the lives of LGBTQ older adults. And Sage partners with companies like ours, service providers, to prepare a compassionate LGBTQ supportive workforce to address the needs of a rapidly expanding aging population. For more information on how Windward can help you, visit our website at www.windwardlifecare.com, uh, windwordlifecare.com. And uh, I think we have time for a couple questions. So let me see what we have in our Q. Um, I think the first one I would like to ask um, is directed to Dr. Sewell. Mm -hmm. So in the hospital and acute care settings, we have known LGBTQ plus individuals to be prohibited from visiting their partner in the ICU. For example, because they don't have advanced directives in place. Are hospitals getting any better at serving the LGBTQ plus community? Um, the short answer to the second part of the question is yes. I do think it's fair to say that we are seeing progress. We also are aware, though, of situations like was described where someone was inappropriately denied access. Um, if that happens, uh, immediate steps should be taken to remedy that situation. And really, it means the first step is, is to call that health system's uh, administration. And, and really voice your concern. Um, it may take some advocacy and, and you may need to even engage some others to help you, but, but that should never happen. Uh, and so please don't sit with it if it does happen. Um, if nothing else, I'm gonna say call me or maybe call Amy and we'll try to point you uh, towards resources to help remove that barrier. Uh, that that's a tragic situation that we just need to prevent. Thank you. I think that was a great answer. Advocacy is very important. Mm -hmm. um, the next question, um, and this could be for either one of you, so feel free to chime in whoever thinks that it's more appropriate. Um, but how do insurance companies justify LGBTQ treatment disparities if it is illegal to discriminate based on sex, gender, race, et cetera? What's mm -hmm. the explanation they provide? Well, let me just jump in and say that this insurance disparity issue is, is more about um, things like if uh, my spouse works for a company, does that company include me in their insurance plan? It, it, those were some of the most uh, vexing barriers that we faced. Now, things have improved uh, and we're seeing uh, those things go away, but um, the problem is they've left a legacy. And the legacy is that uh, some older members of the community 
don't realize things have changed. And so they're not exploring the possibility that they can, they could qualify for a veteran's benefit or a Medicare benefit based on their same sex uh, relationship. So I, I think that's a big source of the disparity is how we afford or provide insurance to people. And as everyone knows from the recent media conversations, a big chunk of Americans are insured through where they work. And so a big chunk of this disparity was that many members of the LGBTQ community didn't have a, a way to get good insurance. Great, thank you. Um, let's see here. Um, this one might be a good question for Amy. Um, LGBTQ seniors with dementia can sometimes forget who their spouse or partner is. What advice would you give them? Would you give the significant other when this happens or if this occurs? Yeah, well, um, the, the, the advice I'd give wouldn't, wouldn't be any different than I'd give to any other spouse or care partner. Um, but of course, I'd have to recognize that there's a, there are additional layers of complexity there, right? In terms of my identity as a spouse, right? Uh, if I'm an LGBTQ partner to someone, a spouse, uh, that's a hard earned identity. And to, for, to lose that um, might be uh, emotionally even more devastating to that person. But this is a hard moment for any partner, anyone who loves and cares for someone who's living with dementia um, and is forgotten uh, by them in that moment. Um, first, I'd say, please know that you're not alone and, and connect that person to support and resources, right, where they can learn about this as um, a, a behavioral expression of, of physical changes that are happening in the brain. This in no way has anything to do with how I feel about you as my spouse, as my partner. I didn't forget you because you're not important to me, right? I forgot you because of problems with um, synapses in, in my brain tissue, right? Um, so helping people really understand the disease and helping care partners to learn how to respond effectively in those moments, right? Instead of reacting out of the, the natural fear and grief and anger and shock that happens in that moment. Um, instead, learning to really respond and listen to that person um, and connect to them, uh, we call this validation, right? And this is a te technique we teach heavily at Alzheimer's San Diego, um, teaching people to just really sort of zo zoom in on what is this person feeling, right? Yeah. In this moment, they don't recognize me. So they're feeling disoriented. Um, so I need to connect to that emotion, right? And reassure them you're gonna see you're gonna see her soon, right? She'll she'll be back later, right? Whatever whatever is gonna be um, supportive to them in that moment. Um, yeah, so it, again, the react rea response wouldn't be any different for anyone, but the the feelings may be. Yeah, yeah no, I, I love that answer, Amy, and I, I'll just uh, maybe restate it a little bit and just say it's a lot about education, as you say, Amy, so that they don't personalize the experience and recognize that what they're witnessing are symptoms of an illness. Uh, but the other key thing that we can do perhaps better than just about anybody is the feeling identification, really acknowledging their feelings, let them speak about their feelings because I'm sure we can all appreciate how painful those moments are. Um, and yet their challenge, of course, some of you may be aware of the book Sandy Braff wrote a few years ago about staying connected while letting go. And that really is the dilemma of the caregiving partner or spouse, regardless of the, any of the other details of the relationship. Yes, I, I can't say enough about the, the benefit of finding, finding your people that have real empathy for this loss and for that, the, the shock that comes in that moment. So finding your support group, um, if it's not the natural supports in your life, right? Finding, finding a group that can, can empathize with that. Yeah. Yeah, thank you guys both for that response. I, I have attended many of the trainings at Alzheimer's San Diego, and I could personally say that they are amazing and mm -hmm. um, very helpful. And I think a lot of the stuff that um, has come up in this presentation is applicable you know, to all of the trainings that they provide. So I, I think all of them are very inclusive and they do a fantastic job with helping people understand the disease and understand what's going on. Um, let's see here, there was another one. Um, oh, let's see. Um, so someone asked, um, I've heard of seniors going back in the closet, quote unquote, when they age, 
what is your experience with this idea? Any thoughts? Well, I do have experience with it as a professional. I will also acknowledge that this is being written about in the scientific literature. Uh, and it really has to do with where we are in terms of acceptance and openness and having welcoming environments. And so uh, depending, especially perhaps on what part of the country you're in and, and also in terms of the particular residential community that's involved, we see still unfortunately kind of a spectrum of experiences. And so I think uh, what can happen is when someone makes that transition from home to residential care, as they settle in, if they're confronted with homophobia, uh, then th their natural response will be to shut down, uh, go back in the closet. And it's almost a reflex because it's a self-defense kind of against discrimination and, and, uh, and uh, abuse and, and so on. So uh, the, the key is we, to prevent that, we just have to be so clear that our environment is welcoming and maybe even more than welcoming, it's validating. And if we can create that environment, then members of this the sexual and gender minority communities won't have to hide themselves, but we have to realize that if they are hiding themselves, it's because of fear of abuse and injury. That makes sense. Um, another question that's kind of on the same, along the same lines was, um, do you guys have any knowledge of um, outwardly LGBTQ specific uh, inclusive facilities here in San Diego or residential care places? Yeah, I, I don't know of a licensed care facility that is uh, that has designated itself as, as you know, sort of specifically for LGBTQ uh, individuals, there are, there are uh, non-licensed housing communities, right? Apartment complexes, um, but they're not providing care. I don't know, Dr. Sewell, do you know of a resource I'm not aware of? No, no, I, I would have said exactly what you said, Amy. The good news is San Diego and a number of other major metropolitan areas have now at least one uh, senior community that's marketed towards the LGBTQ plus community. But as Amy points out, they're just independent living uh, situations. They're not care providing situations. Right. We have one in North Park. We have one yes. on university. I forget exactly the address, but we have one here in San Diego. Yes. The North Park apartments, they're called. There you Easy go. to remember. <laughs> yeah. Yes. I've driven by them many times. <laughs> uh, let's see here. Um, there was another good one down here. Um, I'm less worried about working with younger LGBTQ who are aware, but most of the people I've worked with who are LGBTQ were very deep in the closet. Any thoughts on working with those people? Hmm. Hmm. I, I, I'm pausing only because I'm not sure what kind of work might be um, in that person's mind. Uh, but you know, if it if it's more about the work of supporting someone who's in the closet yet caregiving, it really is going to be following the same kinds of principles of mm -hmm. support, openness, validation. Um, it, over time, you may discover as trust is established, that person may step out of the closet. But um, uh, it's really uh, it's not essential that they do. What's right. essential is that you are just doing your very best to be culturally. Uh, sensitive and humble. Uh, and, and then just you'll just have to see what happens. Um, I, I don't think that uh, it's the right time to do any type of psychotherapy targeting that issue, because if they're caregiving, that alone is pretty much, as we all know, kind of overwhelming. So I, I would still have the focus be more on supporting their role as a caregiver. Totally agree. Yeah, unless it's interfering with, yeah. with their ability to provide care to the person. Right. Yeah. I like that. Um, let's see here. Um, we have time for one more, probably. Um, when would you guys suggest bringing in an expert, like a professional care manager or someone to really advocate for an individual? Well, 
being a recovering care manager myself, um, I, I would I would have to say I'm a big fan um, of uh, I'm a I'm a huge advocate of aging life care um, as a as a field, and I think getting those individuals on board as early as possible um, is is it's certainly what what I teach and what I advocate um, for those individuals that have the resources for it. Um, there's really it's never really too early because they can be such a great objective source of um, sort of uh, moderating these tough conversations, getting people to think uh, about these hard questions, um, getting the documents in place, getting people connected to the legal resources that they need, the fi mm -hmm. financial resources, helping people understand the array of long-term care options that they have. Um, I, I would just say as, uh, as soon as it's feasible, I don't know anything else you'd say there, Dr. Sewell? Yeah, no, a, a few years ago, one of our colleagues, Todd Shetter, who's affiliated with Active Care, came up with this really nice handout that said, do this now. Uh, and, and it was for people who are just realizing that they have dementia or their caregiver realizing that that's uh, what the situation is. And among the do it now things uh, was uh, investigate uh, a caregiving uh, professional that you may not need right then, but that you anticipate you might need in the future. Here's the deal. When you need that person, you're probably already in a state where you're stressed and a lot on your plate and not going to be able to think as clearly or have the time to invest in looking for the right care manager or care, care management firm. So doing that early on when things are still kind of gentle, so to speak, relatively speaking, is, is a smart move. Yeah. Agreed. Well, on, on that note, um, I have an amazing webinar on our Passport to Wellness program that I've just wrapped up uh, production. So I will be sending that out to you guys and you can look for it on our website and social media. Um, any questions that I did not get to today, um, I'm going to have Chelsea save the Q&A and the chat so that we can follow up with people directly. There was a few questions on there that were a little more specific. Um, that might require one of us to have like a one-on-one -on -one conversation with those people. So that's really all the time that we have today. I want to just thank all of you for attending and exploring this topic with us. Um, if you have any questions that were not answered, you can direct them to agingwell at windwardlifecare.com. And if it is pertinent for Dr. Sewell or Amy, we can forward it as appropriate. Um, and thank you again to our wonderful speakers. You guys are amazing, mm, so you. knowledgeable, and this was so appreciated. And uh, just want to wish everyone a great rest of your day. Please stay safe and um, have a great one. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank, thank you, you for very putting much. this all together for us. And Amy, thank you for giving a wonderful talk. It's always an honor to present with you. Likewise. Thank you, Dr. Sewell. Always, always terrific. And thank you, Katie and Winward. This has really been great. Thank you, guys. Okay. Bye-bye now. All right. Take care.